Morrison, welcome. We are so glad that you are here. This is the beginning of a beautiful relationship that we will be having with you coming um, down the road. Uh, so let me tell you, or remind you, or let you know why we're here. The purpose of this time together is to give you information and to share with you um, anything that we think can help you along in this process. So you're going to hear from each of the three rooms that will be interviewing you, and then there will be time for questions towards the end. And so please feel free to keep track of those and make sure that you ask them. We want you informed, and we want you encouraged, and we want you inspired about uh, your articulation of the gospel. So I'm going to begin with Billy. Billy is the chair of P&Q, so he's over this entire process. It's in your hand, brother. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. It's great to have you with us this morning. Uh, we want to try to give you uh, as much information as we can in as little time as possible and leave uh, time for some questions. So thank you for coming a little bit early so we can have some time just to meet and drink. That's always fun for us. I hope it was a, uh, and is a good experience for you. I'd like for you to pull out the piece of paper I handed to all of you that says at the top, Commissioning Provisional Membership Interview, how does the Board of Ward Ministry frame the process? Uh, so I, I'm not going to go over this in great detail because uh, today we have the great uh, uh, honor of having actually the room conveners here. So instead of me talking about the theology room and the worship and proclamation room and the uh, call room, we're actually you're going to actually get to hear from the conveners and the people that are in those rooms. So uh, I don't want to take up too much time. I do want to be clear though about what we are assessing. Uh, as you come before the Board of Ordained Ministry, you're in a little different situation now uh, than you were and that is uh, we are now assessing you on the basis of readiness uh, when you went before the district committee they were assessing you on fitness are you fit for ministry are you a good fit for ministry uh, in our case now uh, that determination has been made and so as you come before us we are assessing for readiness what does readiness mean okay readiness does not simply mean you're ready to come for the interview readiness means that by the end of this interview, if you are recommended, we are fully confident that we can recommend you to the clergy session, and then the clergy session upon your election uh, uh, can uh, fully uh, say to the cabinet, this person is ready to take a full-time appointment. This person is ready to serve full-time in a United Methodist ministry setting. And so that's really what readiness is all about. So. In this interview, we don't expect you to have everything figured out. Most of you have not had a ton of experience in ministry. That's okay. But we are clear that you uh, are clear enough about your theology and you are capable enough in the way you communicate and that you are uh, ready to be able to lead in such a way that the, that, that the cabinet uh, can have confidence uh, that you are ready for whatever appointment um, that they would send you to. So um, with that in mind, I think what I'm going to do is just get out of the way and bring up the different uh, room folks that will talk about uh, the, the different rooms that you'll be in and what goes on in those rooms by way of Dowd from the Theology Room. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. So normally the convener of the Theology Room is Stan Copeland, and uh, when he can't be here for whatever reason, I'm usually an understudy, so I'm standing in for the role of Stan tonight. Just kidding. Um, okay, so you should have a sheet that says the theology room, and uh, Billy's already talked about readiness, effectiveness is obviously an ordination standard. Um, the second bullet point under there is that we're praying for you and pulling for you. We want to be uh, encouraging. Look, we have all been through this process, uh, if we're clergy. And uh, we know that it's pretty high stakes, it's pretty high stress. Uh, we get all of that, and uh, it's like an interview, except kind of on steroids because of all the preparation you have to do, and so uh, we, we know all that. We want you to know that since we got the, uh, the full list in September, uh, we've been praying for y'all in your preparation, and we'll be uh, continuing to pray for you and pull for you as you get ready for the interviews in January, in y'all's case, right? Um, so what we do in preparation number three, I'm on, uh, I've told you all of us have prayed for you. Half of us in the room will have read your paper. Um, the other half will not have, unless they're overachievers, and every room does have an overachiever or two that reads all the papers, but the general practice is half of us have read it, and then the night before 
uh, you get there, we will process your paperwork as a full room, um, identify the stuff that we want to ask you about. It's, it feels like a ton of paperwork, but of course, you can't fully articulate your theology in the limited amount of space you have. And so all of us have open spots in our paperwork, and we'll push you on those and ask you questions. And it's fun. It's supposed to be fun. Um, we hope you approach it that way. <laughs> um, so if you've not been in the rooms yet, uh, you'll need to know that we've got a condensed amount of time, 35 minutes. Uh, we will have prepared questions ahead of time that we really want to start with, but then anyone in the room can uh, follow up on questions. Uh, there will be a timer there that will give us a 10 minute warning, a 5 minute warning, a 1 minute warning, and the convener of the room will try to keep things going. If you get cut off because maybe you're going on too long, don't let that throw you off. It just means we've got other questions we want to get to uh, and we want to make sure we don't run out of time. So number four. Um, please spend a lot of time on your paperwork. So many of you are recently graduated from seminary or will be graduated from seminary in the near term. We do expect seminary level work. Um, so keep in mind that our first impression of you as a candidate, as a theologian, as a potential pastor, uh, whether you're deacon or elder track, is the paperwork. And so uh, put your best foot forward on that. Make sure you have people reading your paperwork who are not just your cheerleaders. We all have those in ministry who will love all of our sermons and all of our letters and all that. Avoid those people if at all possible. Um, and make sure you get a, have a good editor. Um, many people choose to do a mock interview if you're, uh, if you're not used to, kind of a high stakes interview with people firing questions at you about your theology of the Trinity and all that. Um, it wouldn't hurt to do a few of those, just so you get a sense for how that uh, goes. It's good to have somebody accompany you to the interviews, whether that's a mentor, significant other, friend, whatever. Um, you never know. Uh, ideally, what we all hope for is that they're like high-fiving you the whole way back to wherever it is you come from. Um, but if, if it's a rough day, you need it's good to have somebody there with you. And the way it works, um, you guys have probably already talked about the time frame. Like you'll, if you've got an early morning time slot, the interviews will start at 8.30. Each of the interviews are 35 minutes, then you'll have some time to go back over to the Lakeview Room at Proth Row to hang out with your whoever you've brought with you. Um, and then there's like this long lag time after everybody's gone through all the interviews where we process what we've um, uh, experienced in the interviews, and that can take like an hour or so. So um, it's good to have a buddy. Um, if you get hung up on a question in the room, don't let that throw you off. Uh, you can just say, uncle, <laughs> can we move on, next question, whatever. Um, don't let one left turn derail you. So for uh, number five, for commissioning candidates, uh, we do expect that you, are, you can articulate the faith with passion and relevance. I'm going to read these because they're important and we can unpack them a little bit if you've got any. Uh, I guess we're doing questions at the end. Second one is the ability to demonstrate a theological understanding of and commitment to United Methodist doctrine and sin and evil, Wesleyan understanding of salvation, different atonement doctrines, etc. Et so each of us has our own particular, um, like our own personal ways of articulating the faith. And uh, we do not expect, there's a there's a diversity of theologies in the room among the interviewers, both clergy and lay. So we don't expect you to have the right answer. We do expect that you're in the United Methodist tradition. And so if you say something that sounds Calvinist, <laughs> we're going to push you on that. Um, if you don't really care about grace, we're going to really push you on that. So uh, to make sure you're Methodist. Um, hopefully that has been sifted through by now. Uh, a serious... Next bullet point, seriousness and depth in study and openness to growth and theological understanding. None of us is a finely formed uh, product, whether we've been doing it 40 years or 40 months. Um, so, again though, at this stage of the game, if the commission interviews, just make sure you're not this. Um, demonstration of ability to think and communicate theologically with biblical grounding and historical sources in fulfillment of the theological tasks in ordaining ministry in the United Methodist Church. Be ready to name the doctrinal standards. So here's what we mean by this. If the very like the very first question is about God, and it says, talk to us about your understanding of God derived from biblical, historical, and theological sources. 
So if your entire two-page answer is about Gustin and you don't give us any biblical stuff, we're going to expect you to be able to do that in the room. Um, or if you don't really, you need to have, know a theologian other than Wesley. <laughs> we love Uncle John, but you got to know somebody else too. <laughs> um, so just make sure you answer the question. It's really easy not to answer the question because, again, you're trying to pack a whole lot of content in a small space. So make sure you go back when you're done and include stuff. And if the day before the interview, you're reading through your stuff and you realize, oh my God, I don't have any biblical references in my whole uh, section on Christ. Well, that's okay. We probably will have noticed that and we'll probably ask you about it. So don't panic. Just um, be ready to, to engage. It's a lot of, Jack, it's a lot of fun, right? Jack's in the time of my life. <laughs> um, and then on that doctrinal standards, that's, that's the thing where <laughs> you go up for ordination, I'll, I'll be done in a minute. Um, when, you, when you go up for ordination and the, and the bishop asks you the questions, um, will you keep our general rules? Every once in a while, if it's kind of a smart aleck bishop, they'll ask you if you can name them. <laughs> right? And it's good to be able to have that answer. So there's a question in there on doctrinal standards. It's good to know what they are. Because if you don't list them, if you list them, we probably won't ask you. If you don't list them, we'll probably ask you. So, no pop quiz. I won't ask you what they are right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. I had the great privilege of um, helping to lead the worship and proclamation room. So I'm echoing everything that Chris just said in terms of as you prepare for your time with us and the time constraints and all of that. There are just some specifics that maybe uh, will be helpful to you that I'm going to go over real quickly um, in terms of how we operate, which is the same pretty much as, as the other two rooms. Um, there is a plagiarism policy copied on the back table. Please take a copy of that just for your own reference. Um, we do check. And so, as I said earlier, just don't. Just don't do it. Just don't go to the internet and, you know, pull something down. We'll know. And, um, and it's not you. So what we're looking for is your, how you are prepared to make the proclamation of the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ and salvation as a Wesleyan. We understand that there are differences, obviously, between deacons and elders. We also understand that not everybody gets the opportunity to preach every week. Um, and so we certainly take that into consideration. And we are open to alternative forms of proclamation. However, at this level, what we really want to know is if you are prepared to proclaim. We want to know um, if you're Wesleyan, as, as Chris said. We want to know if you can integrate that understanding into the way that you, your proclamation is affected in the community in terms of liberation and mission and, and grace. And so uh, we want to know how you are observing that proclamation. However you do it, uh, preaching, you know, first of all, is lived out. I, I, I think the designated texts are required to be preached. Is that correct? The designated text? The Philippians text has got to be a sermon, right? Um, but I, you also have an alternative text, and, and we are open to alternative proclamation, whether you healing services, teaching opportunities, whatever. But just make sure it's thorough and prepared. Um, some of you preach a lot, and that's great, and you preach from outlines. We need a manuscript, even though it will be, it's videoed. Um, we really need to see the words as they, um, as you have written them. Um, regarding the sacraments, again, we want to see that you're Wesley and that you understand the, uh, our understanding of grace and salvation and how the sacraments are lived, that grace uh, that we have through the sacraments is lived out in the world. Um, any, anything else? Yeah, we have a Bible study with this. That's right. We have the Bible study with you all, which we love and we enjoy a lot. That I know is a lot of work, but it's really, really indicative to us um, uh, of a lot of things. And so please, please, um, Enjoy that process because we certainly enjoy reading them and have asked permission to use them on occasion. So, um, anything else? I would I would like the members of who are here from our room to stand up just so you'll know. Um, Billy, 
Paul, Linda, John, Elizabeth, Cassie, and then there are several folks who are not here. But we are, you know, as I said, open and, and shared earlier, and Chris kind of shared this as well in a different way. We're not gotcha people. We're not going to set you up, okay? Um, we're, all, we're with you in that room, and we want you to enjoy our time together and have some fun. My name is Henry Lesner. I'm uh, the lay guy in the room and a uh, member of First United Methodist Church Allen. So uh, I have the honor of uh, convening the call room, call service and discipline life. Uh, you should have a handout. If you don't have that, uh, I'm going to go over it and uh, just highlight some things here. First thing I want you to know is the folks that are in the room with uh, us are listed up there. Um, I would ask our call folks, just many of them have left, but Gretchen's still here, Cheryl's still here, Tim is here, Matt is here, Ugana's here. So these are folks you can come to and ask if there's anything that you hear about uh, what I'm talking here. So, um, everybody said that they're the fun room, that's not true, we're the fun room. <laughs> so uh, after you've uh, been grilled in theology and you've uh, sweated out your sermon series and stuff, you come to our room and we're going to try to get to know you. That's what we're all about, is trying to get to know you. So there's a couple things on here. I just I listed uh, uh, paragraphs from the Book of Discipline that uh, we're not going to quiz you on those things. But if you know those, what's in those paragraphs, you will probably do better in all three rooms, by the way. So I would just encourage you to pull out your Book of Discipline, and uh, there's an enormous amount of good information in there. Uh, read that and become very familiar with it so you can do that. Go to the one that says commissioning interviews. Uh, we're looking for readiness, and this is literally the list of things we're going to ask you about. So uh, I would encourage you, as others have said, practice. And we're, we're telling you what we're going to ask. Practice your answers. So don't you're not making it up on the fly when you get there. So a couple things that we're going to do. Uh, we have some specialized people in our room. I do finances. I will see your credit report, um, and I do that prior to you coming to the room. So if you have an issue of debt, that's what we're really worried about. Uh, we like to see a written plan. We'd like for you to have a conversation. I want you to have a conversation with me if you have a problem. Uh, or I will reach out to you if I find it. Uh, th this is, uh, there's guidelines on the very back here, what the, the United, what North Texas Conference says. Or your debt guidelines, uh, there's a lot of flexibility in this. I want to know that you know what your circumstances are and that you're doing something about it. That's the main thing for me. Um, we've had people that have enormous amounts of debt and they've been able to tell me and show me how they're going to deal with that. And that's fine. That's what I want to know. We have Gretchen in the back. Gretchen is an MD, doctor. Gretchen will be looking at medical things that you have. And again, prior to getting in the room, very confidential what she does. It's not like everybody in the room talks about it. So Gretchen will be looking at medications, maybe things that are clues to issues that you may have. Are you taking your medications if you have them? You know, we want to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. How, what's your life work mix? Some of those kind of things. We actually may get to that in the interview. We also have a lady, Pat Deal, who's not here today. Pat is the one who reviews your psych reports. Again, prior to, the, to coming to the room, to the interview, she's looking at that, and sometimes we may talk about that in the room. We want to know, most importantly, you take those psych reports, you pay for those psych reports, you might as well listen to what they have to say and try to take uh, that into account in your life, how you live your life. So that's a really important thing for us to know, that you're taking that, what your psych report says, you're following or taking it into account in how you live your day-to-day -day life. So that's one of the key things. We will look at your transcripts, your recommendation letters, all those kind of things, again, prior to the interview. We're not going to ask you about that. We're just looking to see what people say about you to get an idea. Just to, again, get to know you before uh, you come into the room. So when you get into the room, as you've heard, uh, we've got 35 minutes. It's pretty intense. Uh, and fun. And fun. And fun. We actually laugh occasionally in our room, right? Occasionally. But um, 
And I've cried in our room, by the way, when I hear some of the call stories. So uh, those are big things of the heart when we hear that. We will ask you about your call story when you come here. When you get to ordination, we don't really spend much time on that because we would have heard it at this level. But so be precise, be concise. We only have 35 minutes. You know, so kind of think about how that works. Practice this with somebody before you get there. Practice it with somebody before you get there. I'm going to say that multiple times. Uh, we're going to ask you about uh, maybe your management style. How do you deal with people? I mean, if you're going into the ministry, whether deacon or elder, you're going to be dealing with people. And we want to know how do you perceive things. How do you handle conflict? We're going to ask you about those kind of things. We want to know about your experience with inclusivity and justice ministries. You're early in your ministry, but I bet somewhere in your life you have had some circumstance <laughs> where you've had to stand up for something or you did inclusivity. Inclusivity covers a wide range of stuff, okay? So just, again, prior to coming to the room, we will ask you about this, okay? There are individuals in our room who kind of like, I want to ask them about that. And they will ask you about it. Um, we want to know about, I, I've mentioned here, I'm going to say it again. How do you take care of yourself physically? Are you, are you, you, know, are you doing things... If you're uh, uh, you know, a runner or something like that, we want to know just what do you do to take care of yourself physically. If you have some sort of a problem or something, don't hesitate to talk to us about that. We have medical and psychological advice that we can help you with those kind of things. That's what we're here for. Um, one of the big deals is, and uh, we talked about this with the folks coming in for ordination, but it applies to you as well. And that is, will you, if you're an elder, will you itinerate? The bishop literally was here before everybody came in the room and told us about that. There are, you know, that is a big deal. If you're going to be an elder in the United Methodist Church, you, when you, if somebody lays hands on you, you commit to do what the United Methodist Church says you're going to do. And one of those things is itinerant. And uh, that's a difficult thing, I know that, but uh, we will ask you about that. What do you think about it? And why is that important in the United Methodist Church? We will ask you about that probably too. So again, think about those things prior to coming in the room. Um, and again, I'll say practice, practice, practice. All those people that uh, you've seen stand up with the uh, theology room, uh, the call room, and the worship and sacraments room, they are all willing. We are here for you. We want to help you get through this. We want to help you understand where you want to go in with, with your ministry and that sort of thing. We are here to help you. So do not hesitate to ask. So anyway, that's... What I'll have to say, and we'll be around later for questions. Marsha Middleton, I'm the Board of Ordain Ministry um, Officer here. And so it's my job, among other things, to collect and um, uh, document your documents. If that makes any sense. So the thing I'm most concerned about today is, you got, is UM Cares Plus, which is a software that we use to have you all move through the track, um, which is the 2020 commissioning candidates. And so if you are not already on UM Cares, you need to um, get there quickly, just as soon as you can, because you've got folks um, way ahead of you who, who have already sent in a whole bunch of stuff and, and they're making really good progress so I would just invite you to be aware of the need to do that. There is a document you should have received that gives you basic instructions once you log in, where you go and how that works. So um, I can help if you get stuck. Let me give you a word. This is not the software of the century. <laughs> so occasionally you will panic, and I promise because this has happened to me, you will go on you will um, have put a document there, you know it's there, you've seen it there, you will log on and it's not there. And you will call me, sometimes very late at night, in a panic, and go, what happened to my whatever? I put it in there. <laughs> and so what I will tell you, I'm just going to tell it to you now, log out, um, turn your computer off, turn your computer on. I'll wait 30 minutes. Turn it back on again, uh, upload it again, and it will probably be there. 
Who knows where it goes? But I'm, I'm telling you the truth. This will happen. It's happened. It happens to those of us who are looking at the documents too. We'll look in one minute. You know, if I read half a paper and I go back to read the other half, it ain't there. And I'm like, what in the heaven's name? What happened to that? So, I want you to be aware of that glitch, and um, it is there. If it doesn't come back, let me know, and we'll we'll work to rectify that. Um, on the steps, you all received from me a uh, sheet of instructions for the steps. There are a bunch of steps. Please read the instructions. Please read the instructions. Read them carefully because there are dates on there that are different um, for some of the items than for the big paper submission in December. You all actually have some things due next week. And um, it's really important for me to be able to contact your references and whatnot to get those as early as possible. If we wait too long, uh, particularly around the holiday season, I don't get those back. And since you all go up for your interviews in January, I've got to be sure I have those before folks really break for the holidays. So please be aware uh, of getting all those things to me. Read the instructions in the steps also. Um, when you open the step, it'll have a little blurb that'll tell you how to work it. And please read that, and that'll answer a whole bunch of your questions. But um, don't, don't think, and if this is your second time around, um, congratulations. There have been a lot of people here um, second time around, too. So don't worry about that. Just do your best. But you may notice a few changes from last year, and that's because we've tried to update and clarify what some of those steps mean and how they work. So I'm gonna go ahead right now quickly. Any questions from you all regarding um, the documents or UM Cares Plus? Yes, sir. Hi, Marcia. I think, I think you may have answered this question before, for me previously, but I'd just like to, to ask it again. Sure. Because yeah, I don't remember what your response was. Um, so our, our uh, psychological reports those, those would have been sent to you from, or, or hopefully they've been sent to you from, let's say, Carol uh, at, the, at, the, at the district office or, or Alice. Um, I, I, my question was, I can't remember, the psychological report, uh, whether that's among them or if we, we need, you need us to send you a new copy somehow of that. Of so that I report. probably have it, okay. um, but it's always good to check on that, and the way you do that is you just send me an email. And I will email you back and list all the documents that I have in your file. If you have been in the system a while, um, there are folks who are coming after having been out for a while and haven't gone through, you know, just consecutive years. Um, it is possible we do not have materials. Um, if you came through last year, I should have all of your materials. So. Um, if you will email me, we will double check that. I'm trying to mark everything off. I, I uh, file documents every day when I get here to work and um, I try to mark things off, but sometimes those are tough um, because you have multiple documents asked for in a step. If I mark the step complete, I may not have all the documents and it's confusing. So um, it's best to just send me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can with that. Anything else? All right. Um, this is an amazing moment in the life of the Board of Four Day Ministry. We have saved plenty of time for questions. So uh, we want to entertain those questions now uh, about anything in the process. Um, Anna and Chris and Henry will answer questions about any of the rooms. I'm happy to answer any questions about the process, or Marsha will as well. So, what questions do you have? What um, would you please explain kind of what the day looks like and the space and uh, get them all prepared for Pro -throw? Sure. Okay, so we meet at the Pro Throw Center, um, which is up at Lake Texoma. It's a beautiful place and it's a, a wonderful retreat setting. One of the reasons we go up there is so that we can get in a real retreat setting and get away from everything that we've got going on back home and we can focus on you and on uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, so there's two sessions each day and three candidates are in each session. So if you're in the morning session, we start at 8.30 in the morning, we like you there at 8 o'clock 
so that uh, you can um, uh, be ready for us to start at 8.30. Uh, by the time we take you through all three rooms and then go through uh, the process of deliberation uh, uh, about your application and, and whether or not we're going to recommend you, uh, it usually is not done until about 12.15, sometimes 12.30. Okay, so you just need to block out that amount of time. If you would like to stay out at the Pro Throw Center the night before because you live far away and want to just to go, that is fine, but you need to make those arrangements. Okay, I'm not going to do that for you. You just need to call Pro Throw Center and, and, and see if you can make that work. If you're in the afternoon session, we start at 1.30, 1.30 in the afternoon. And again, it's about another four hours. By the time we get everything done, it's usually 5.15, 5.30. Uh, before we are finished. So you'll be either in the morning or the afternoon setting. Um, somebody mentioned this, Chris, I think did. It's really great to bring somebody with you or some bodies with you. Now what I'm going to tell you is bring somebody that is not going to induce more anxiety in you. <laughs> right? You want to bring the non-anxious presence. You may have somebody that really loves you the best. But they are going to be so anxious that they're just going to make you more anxious. So, you know, choose somebody that's not going to make, not going to induce more anxiety into the process than is already present. So um, that would be a good thing. Um, we have a prayer room set up. Uh, we'll pray with you before we get started. Uh, and it's it, it, as I think Chris described. It's it's kind of this rhythmic sort of. You go into an interview for 35 minutes. You step out for 15, you go to a second interview for 35 minutes, you step out for 15 minutes, you go to a third interview uh, for 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and then you're out for 15 more minutes, and then there is about, let's say about an hour, sometimes to an hour and 15 minutes uh, for deliberation on the whole thing. So um, that's what the day looks like. Yes, Anne. Uh, did, did you tell them there are hosts and hosts? Yeah, right. So there, there will be in, uh, with your hosts and hosts, Yes, hosts that will be there to basically get you from place to place. So you'll show up at Prothrow Center, you'll come to what's called the Lake View Room, which is the great big room that's right by the dining hall. And from there, there will be people that will help you get to each one of the rooms and bring you back. Yeah. Okay? Is that kind of enough on that? Okay. Where will we know our time Yeah, thank you, Kelly. So uh, in late December, after I know that uh, you are, that everything has been turned in and that you actually uh, are. Uh, going to be coming for the interview, uh, then I will send you an email with that information. Now, prior to that, uh, so we're doing this, I think, the 27th through the 29th of January. That's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. If there is one day that is really better for you than another, I need to know that. Um, if you are needing a morning time instead of an afternoon time or vice versa, I need to know that. I will attempt to accommodate that. But I can't always promise that. If everybody says, oh, well, we all have Bible study on Wednesday and everybody needs to go on Monday, somebody's got to go on Wednesday, okay? So we just have to have to be able to make that work. But I'll send that to you late in December. I try to wait until all the paperwork's in and that it's all been checked and everything because occasionally what will happen is, is that if I put the schedule together before that and it's all a matrix, right, of who's going where and what room at what time, uh, if I do it before that and then somebody decides to self-defer and pull out of the process that it has to be done all over again. So usually late December, I'll say, you know, something really fun, like the week after Christmas, you'll get an email from me. <laughs> hey, ready for your board of ordain ministry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, Matt. Uh, Billy, it's been said to us from the top down, Bishop Down, the importance of itinerancy and the preparation for that. Um, how does that apply for candidates for deacon? Right, so we don't have our cabinet uh, representative in the room at the moment, but yeah, I think one of the things that's really important is that if you are on the deacon track, uh, you need to be very much in touch with your district superintendent about your appointment, okay? Because one of the things that you will find out is that you finish your interview, and if at the end of your interview you are, rec are being recommended, one of the things we're going to tell you is that your commissioning is contingent upon an appointment. Okay? Let's be real clear. The Board of Ordained Ministry does not make appointments. Okay? 
So we, we have nothing to do with your appointment. So if you come out and are recommended in late January, uh, then what you're immediately going to want to do, whether you are a deacon track candidate or an elder track candidate, is you're going to want to contact your district superintendent and make sure they've got that clear and on the list. Um, and, you know, if there's, if there's some um, things that are unusual about that or some not sures about that, you need to be checking in with your DS and continuing to check in with your DS uh, about that. But, um, yeah, that's, that's a really good, good question for everyone, not just elder track candidates, but for deacon track candidates as well. Okay? All right, what else? I bet Jack has some answers. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Do you, have a, do you have some answers, Jack? I'm not going to give you the microphone if you don't have answers. <laughs> yeah, I go for it. yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so uh, this is very important. Um, as we talk about this, we talk about it being fun, being enjoyable. It may not be. Uh, what it is is serious. It's very serious. Um, if you were going before, uh, the Bar Association, you would take it very seriously and you wouldn't expect to have fun. If you were going before the American Medical Association, you would take it very seriously. And I encourage you to do that, to take it very seriously. Uh, you have been given guidelines that are clear. And you also have a Board of Ministry that would welcome a phone call from you anytime, any one of us would be more than happy to give you whatever wisdom or guidance we might have. Uh, so do really well with this, because we're going to expect that. And uh, we trust that you are prepared. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. And so exercise that. And the enjoyment that you experience will be when we say you are going to be recommended candidacy. So, uh, commissioning, that's right. Okay, so that's the only answer I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what else? Questions about submittals, questions about any of the things that you heard about in the rooms, question, anything? I have a question. Yes. Okay. So, uh, I'm curious, I'm thinking about the, the proclamation room, and I'm yep. thinking about the sermons that we'll be submitting. Now, one of them, of course, is going to be the Philippians text. But for the other one, let's say you have a few, let's say you have a couple of choices, like you videoed a couple of sermons. Um, I guess, uh, how, how would we, how should, do you have any guidelines or recommendations for how we decide which other sermon or whatever our alternate expression is to submit? Like what, what's something maybe that we should be looking for in those that, would, that the, the board really would like to see? Annie, you want to respond to that? Yeah. Don't put your worst sermon out. Okay. <laughs> uh, we want to see authenticity in your proclamation. Right. So, um, and, well, let me give you, which I neglected to do earlier, one of the, several of the things we're looking for, we want a central message to be concise. We want to know you did your exegetical homework. We don't need 20 minutes of exegesis explaining it to us. We, we need to see that it's there, okay? But we don't need to, we need to know that you did that. Um, we need to see a clear form and good language and Im imagery and good presentation in whatever venue. So um, if you can, and I have those rubrics, I've got those copied if, if y'all want them. But um, so put, the, the authenticity of the proclamation as you proclaim it is what we're looking for. Is that sure. anybody else? That's great. And, and I guess I would just add to that, Nick, that um, this is probably not the time uh, unless you are doing something really fantastic uh, that you go way outside the box in terms of the kind of proclamation. Yeah. Right? I mean, now, if it's great, if it's so fabulous that everybody's going to go, wow, <laughs> that's what we all need to be doing in the next 20 years, then that's fabulous. 
But if it's something that's sort of experimental and it kind of went okay, but the technology wasn't really good when we were watching it and you couldn't really tell what was being said and it was kind of hard to understand what the central message was or what the scripture was or any of those kinds of things, I would not recommend that's what you want to submit. Okay. Yes. Uh, are we going to receive a list of who will be in the room for worship and proclamation? Uh, yeah. Well, we stood up. You can write our names down. <laughs> 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 I mean, you, you, you take our names. Yeah, we don't mind doing that here. We'll yeah. do this right quick. Go ahead, Chelsea. I mean, where's the worship? I'm, I'm, in, I'm in, Chelsea. I'm there. Right. Anna, yeah. John, Cassie, Cassie okay. Paul. Okay. Linda. 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 Oh, this is stressful. Did you say earlier that you were going to try to have Yeah. I will send will send. Those. Okay, all right. Anna's going to send it. Chelsea, did you hear that? Great. Anna's going to send it. Okay. And, and i got to tell you, just so that you'll know, um, you know, a lot of things happen. And so um, normally... Every room has about 10 to 12 people in it. On certain days and certain times, there might be nine, or there might be 12, something like that. The other thing is occasionally we will also uh, at times do a little moving around. So everybody today that is in that room, there may be one or two additions or subtractions from that room. So, yeah. But I wouldn't like, you know, take our pictures and put them up on a board and try to... <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. That's exactly right. Okay. are going to ask us to lunch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're not above that either. Okay. Um, anybody else? What else? Paul, you had something? I just... What Anna was saying... Um, just a word about um, not just giving us the sermon, but like reviewing it before you come and see us and then being ready to just talk about it. It's like, we all know that even the best sermon will have some words of, well, I would have done this different, or I wish I could have done that in that space. It's almost always in the midst of sermon preparation, we're going to ask how you got started, right? I mean, what was the process you went through to preach this sermon? And, uh, you know, we, we all have some different things like that. John? If, if you are evaluating different sermons, one, one of the things that I would suggest is um, pay attention to the response that you've gotten. And the response you don't want to go with is, that was a really nice sermon, Pastor. If there's, if there's something substantial that happens out of it, that, that's a really, really good sign. Um, the other thing I'd like to just say about in general is, if someone on the board offers you help with something, take them up on it. That's a sign that they're seeing something that you might need help with. So don't think of that as just a casual kind of a thing. We're pretty busy people, so we <laughs> yeah. are, you, you really need to take us up on that. Okay. So I also want to clarify something I said just a moment ago. Um, so all, all preaching uh, is prophetic, right? But uh, when I talk about, you know, be careful about not doing something to innovate. But I don't want anybody hearing me say, I, we don't want to hear prophetic sermons. We don't want to hear sermons about just. In fact, we'd love to hear something very rich in terms of how you're going to be able to preach prophetically and uh, speak a word of justice and those uh, and, and on those particular topics. So we're not asking you to avoid that either. So I want to be real clear about that. If, if there's a... Um, uh, what some people might say is a more controversial subject, and you've got a really great sermon, then let us have that. That'd be great. Okay? What else? Yes? Are we allowed to bring anything into the room? Great. That? What does that look like? That is a great question. Yes. We are. Uh, we want you to be welcome to bring uh, your stuff in with you, particularly your questions, because at times... In your paperwork, one of the board members might say, on page 13, you said this. And I wondered if you could clarify. Well, it's only fair to you if you know what you wrote on page 13. So, uh, yeah, we want you to be able to bring those things in. Now, we hope you will bring those things as, as reference, right? So we hope that you're not scripting your answers, anticipating what we're going to ask. And then when we ask you a question, you open the book up and just start reading out of your notes. Um, it's... You know, we, we want you to have a real conversation with us. 
and but we know that if we want you to do your best uh, we're not trying to trick you up on what you wrote we want to have a real conversation about what you wrote so it's fine to bring your notes and everything in with you at that point uh, we just want you to know that when we get into it we want to have a real conversation and if we need to refer to something you wrote then that's fine okay yes um, I've heard, and this could just be here saying that some board members will take your notes and ask a question. Is this true? No. Not anymore. Okay. okay. Not anymore. Yeah. Yeah. They're, everybody's got an old story about somebody that did something to them when they went through the Board of Ordained Ministry. And those stories are probably true. Okay. But, um, as our bishop said to us earlier, um, the Board of Ordained Ministry like all good Christians, are going through a process of sanctification and we are hopefully going on to perfection. So, no, I, someday, many, many years from now, when I retire, if you and I want to sit down, I'll tell you some stories about things like that that were done. But no, we don't. No, that is not. No one on the board is going to pull your notes away from you and say you can't do that. Yeah. But thanks for asking. Nick? Sure. Uh, there was a, I can't remember who said it earlier, but someone was, was talking about the, uh, uh, in, in theology, talking about how, you know, in your paperwork, you want to, you want to be referencing more than, than just Wesley. And I guess I was curious about, um, you know, because I've also heard sort of advice from other board members in the past, like, make sure you're not, you know, filling it chock full of, you know, all this, like, too many uh, references to other theologians. So I guess I would, just curious uh, if anybody could offer some clarification on that, like, you know, sort of, you know, how many, maybe uh, just as an example, how many theologians or should we kind of reference or should we just give a little more, just a little more detail of what you're thinking about that? Yeah, so when you're comparing like ordination papers to commissioning papers, commissioning papers are much more academic. Um, you don't just want to spend two pages in your guide answer citing people. Um, but it does need to show uh, reference to, to, I mean, answering the question, historical, biblical, theological sources. There's not really a magic number. You know when you see it. Um, but I I would say showing some kind of a, a breadth of reading is important. And more so at commissioning than at ordination, because this is the more. Um, I mean, we really do, in the theology room, uh, you know, down the line we'll, work, we'll be talking about integration of theological concepts with the practice of ministry, but now we really just need to know that you know your stuff. So it's not like a paper you would submit for systematics, but it's um, it looks a little bit like that in terms of references. So the way I would parse that is to say, uh, in this paper, we want to know what you believe and why you believe it. And so it's not just a process of can you impress us academically by quoting a lot of sources. We want to know that whatever sources you do quote, that matters to you a great deal in, in what you believe. Yeah, so we, yeah, I think Chris makes a really good point. This is not simply a systematics paper you're writing for theology. You're, you're writing uh, very deeply, at a very deep level about what it is you believe, and at a very deep level why you believe it. I'm in the theology room. Um, I would just say that don't add sources just to add sources. You've got to be clear where you stand on something, and then you want sources to support your argument as you would in any kind of persuasive writing, right? Um, so you don't just add the, add the sources for the heck of it. You've got to like, have a point to it, which I know you know. But. Okay. Um, I think it's just going to be a few more shows. So, are you wanting enough diversity to where I'm not just using Wesleyan scholars like Outler or Asbury? Like, do you want more of that, even a variety of that? I would say um, it, it just depends on the question. Yeah. Some of them are a lot more inclined to be through and through Wesleyan than others. Some of them, from a just historical uh, perspective, you're going to have to go back way before that. So I think it just depends, would you say, on the question? Yeah. Thanks. Yes, David. Is, is there a desired like um, sourcing, like citing our sources? Do we want Chicago, Turabian, or do we just want to do parenthetical 
kind of sourcing? Is that what we're looking at? I would encourage you not to do parenthetical. Okay. I would encourage you to do endnotes or footnotes. I personally like um, footnotes because I think they're easier to follow. Would you say that to be true? But um, I don't think we care about the particular, if it's AMA or, you know, which, which of the which of the forms you use. I just think parenthetical probably is not the way to go, unless it's just a biblical text. Okay. Yeah. And I'm guessing too, you want it to be consistent throughout the paperwork. Oh, so like, yeah. you don't want to do one style for two or three questions, and then the next two or three questions, you've done some others. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was just following what she answered. I was gonna say, does that include biblical yeah. references? Those can be parenthetical, or would you rather have those footnotes? I think they can be. For me, I'm fine with them being parenthetical. Okay. Um, I, you sort of just don't want anything really long in there to mess the flow of your argument or whatever. Okay. This is Cheryl Murphy. Um, I'm in the call room, so I'm going to say something quite different than what you just heard from theology. You've all made it through DCOM, so I imagine you have your call story down. If you tell your call story and you don't include God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, the call room is going to have an issue with you. We need spirit, somewhat spirit-filled answers. Just like you need to be academic there, we need to know that you've been called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and to be a leader and part of our connection. If we don't hear that, it's going to be a problem for me and probably some of the others in the call room. So just know as important as the academic is, is the spirit work in our room. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you'd like to say? Yeah, just close it up. Okay. All right. Last chance for questions before Tim closes it up. <laughs> It's like a surgery. We're going to close <laughs> up. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. Yes, Angela. Yes, there are uh, an amount of uh, our page limits. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, it's good. always a good question. It comes up. So, um, Brian, you're going to submit a lot of things. So what I'm speaking to now are the disciplinary okay. questions. All right? The disciplinary questions. And we are not... Um, rigid about a page limit because some of us format the paper differently. I, I personally like it when a new question is started at the beginning at the top of a page. So in other words, instead of, so, so if you do that, that means there's going to be, it, depending on where the question and the answer ends, I'm sorry, depending on where the answer ends, you may have three quarters of a blank page. So then counting pages that make as much sense. I would tell you, with that, your disciplinary question paperwork is going to come out somewhere between 30 and 35 pages. I also, this year, um, one of the things I did was I put an additional page count on the questions that are asked in our annual conference. Right. So there's another step for that you get another four pages for that. So roughly two pages of question, roughly. Um, but I did not include that in the 30 pages, which we've done before, because I just didn't think that was a reasonable thing to do. So what you need to know also is that the disciplinary questions get sort of spread out among all three rooms, but not equally. The balance, the largest amount of the disciplinary questions go to the theology room. And then there are another set of questions that go to the call room. And then uh, the uh, worship and proclamation room gets the one question regarding the sacraments. Okay. Yes, Can you say a word about the formatting for the Bible study? Are we expecting similar... So like mine is like a lot of questions and a lot yeah. of like discussion, so it's not formatted like a paper. Right. It's formatted for a Bible study. We sure. Need to be able to sure. Be able and one of the things we want to hopefully is that we want to know one either you've taught it or you're getting ready to teach it, so it needs to be in a format where you've thought through or had the experience of what was it like to teach it. You know, where would I've done some things differently? Um, I will say, however, that it's important that the other qualification there is could you hand this Bible study off, and so if there is uh, for example, you know, some really important exegetical work or introductory work and things like that, that needs to show up in the paperwork, in the, in the actual Bible study, because then we would know, okay, 
you can hand this off to somebody. You're not just handing them a bunch of questions, you're also handing them the informational stuff as well. So would have preferred, instead of footnotes, perhaps in the Bible study, would have bibliography be preferred yes. for external Yeah, that'd be great, sure. That'd be, yeah. that'd be awesome. Yeah. Okay. All right. Just a quick question. Yeah. So the, the software, you have cares, basically, uh, that, that's the throughout the denomination are using that, or did she make some, adjust, make some adjustments for the actual conference? Or is that yes, the so the UM Cares Plus software is software that the whole denomination uses. We pay, we pay for that, 